directed music videos such as Crank That by Soldier Boy, Grand Theft Autumn by Fallout Boy, We Fly High by Jim Jones, and so many more legendary videos. And um, this is why I'm hot by Mims. I used to love that song back when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you think it is about your videos that leave such a great legacy and resonate so deeply across the world? That's a really good question. Um, I've always challenged myself to look into a particular genre of music or artist that maybe I wasn't familiar with that I saw on social media. Um, people who I'd known for years, I, even, if, even from playing hockey and soccer and baseball with these kids, I may not have spoken to them for you know a couple of decades, but we still knew each other. Yeah. So when I suddenly see one or two or three of them, my um, former um, friends post memes of um, images and visual visuals of black men getting shot by cops and laughing about it. I'm like, wow, I've never seen this before ever coming from, I've seen it because it existed from the extremes on both sides, but to see it coming from, you know, closer circles and people mm -hmm. that you grew up with that you never knew had that sort of perspective. Yeah. No, slavery is just wrong. And you still post things like this. What would make you think that this is not okay? Mm. And it finally occurred to me. I said, "Wow, okay. What if it was their mother, mm. or their daughter, or their brother, put in that same situation that they're posting about?" Mm. That was the trigger for me to develop and create Cracker. That is insane. But thank you so much for your time today. You have a, such a good history about you. You know, I can't wait to like pick your brains. <laughs> sure, sure. I look forward to it. Amazing. That. So thank you so much, Dale, again, for being a guest on my show today. And as a versatile and visually explosive music video director, ranging from heavy metal to rock to rap, and also as an amazing film director, how did you first fall in love with the directing? And is this something you always knew you wanted to do? Uh, I... I often ask myself that question and I trace it back to my roots as a, as a, as a kid. I just used to love movies and yeah. I never realized that loving movies and loving stories and characters uh, could be something that could actually be something that you could do as a career. Mm -hmm. I remember I came up in a different time, you know, as a child of the eighties, when you're going to school, there were no mobile phones. There was no internet. There was nothing. There was no, content creators, there were no influencers, there were actors, directors, firemen, cops, you know, construction workers, doctors, yep. lawyers. It was one of those, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, but as I traveled and, and I made my way around life, I found myself um, in front of the camera as an actor, then eventually behind the camera uh, telling stories, yeah. Amazing, that's a beautiful story and it's true. Back in the day, it used to be so like tunnel vision, you do this or that. But as the world has developed, we've been able to like dig into all our various things that we're interested in, you know, and it's great. It's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've directed music videos such as Crank That by Soldier Boy, Grand Theft Autumn by Fallout Boy, We Fly High by Jim Jones, and so many more legendary videos. And um, this is why I'm hot by Mims. I used to love that song back when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you think it is about your videos that leave such a great legacy and resonate so deeply across the world? That's a really good question. Um, I've always challenged myself to look into a particular genre of music or artist that maybe I wasn't familiar with that um, I would challenge myself into, into, into visu visually on trying to understand what their audience, what their fans would like. So yeah. uh, part of it is, is, the, is that competitive nature visually to always challenge myself to be um, open to the, to the challenge at hand. Uh, I also just put so much of myself into uh, the moment of that particular song mm -hmm. or, or, the, or that moment of that artist's career. Sometimes you're working with an artist, in the case of Fall Out Boy, 
or Soldier Boy, it was like their first real big opportunity. Um, just as they were being signed to, or just about before being signed to major labels. Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, it's like working with a band like Alter Bridge or Five Finger Death Punch, or um, you know Rick Ross, uh, uh, or even you know a Ty Dolla Sign. It's like when they're already established. Yeah. It's like what can I bring to the table that somebody else already hasn't hasn't brought. Mm -hmm. So uh, my my affinity for all things cinematic and epic as opposed to, you know, visual hijinks and chicanery uh, in, in, in gags, I guess, uh, is always, again, it, it, I'm, I'm just even saying that traces me back to a different time mm -hmm. where it's like, I just grew up loving movies where yeah. things were just a lot more, um, you know, overall just uh, beautiful and things are done on film. There was, more time being taken to tell the story mm -hmm. you weren't jammed into just having to bang things out like cookie cutter style yeah so even in even though i've been a i've been around for this music video journey when it was still the big glorious days of music videos i've managed to transition into this newer world by adapting a lot of those sim that, that, that same ideology and visual techniques into today's world yeah. without falling into a visual trap of being a one-trick pony Mm. So I, I think that kind of, I think that kind of helped explain um, why there is such a broad base of success through multiple genres. Yeah. Because I, I, I keep the core of my visual sense in place. Yeah, that's really important. And it's true. It's so key to be able to adapt with the times, but still keep the true essence of your craft. You know, like I'm like the world's biggest fan of Michael Jackson. And I remember back in the day where people used to do an album, take like five years off, drop the next album. But you're right in this day and age of like the Rihanna's and the Dua Lipa's who I love. It's like every year they have a new album. So it's really interesting how times have changed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Visually, sonically, uh, tech. You know, tech wise, it's just, yeah. there's just so many things that uh, you need to keep up with yeah. um, from either side of the coin, whether you're on the side of providing or mm. whether you're on the side of consuming, mm. it's, it's very laborious. Yeah. It's very laborious. <laughs> uh, I find myself on a music standpoint, I find myself listening to the things I often, I've, I've, I've always liked to listen to because sometimes it's daunting to try to, you hear about, if you talk to five different friends you haven't spoke to for some time, you hear about five different artists you never heard of before, <laughs> of new genres you never heard of before. Then it becomes like this world of okay, how do I kept? It's not about. It's it's still really about, you know, centering yourself, finding what's important to you and, and what you like because you literally could get lost. It's like you know, driving down a road, or a freeway, <laughs> or a highway. You can take any multiple, you know, exits, but which yeah. one you may stay on the one that you know is gonna gonna, gonna take you home. So. I'm exactly like that too. I remember when Kendrick Lamar came out, it took me like a year and a half or two to listen to his new album. My brother kept saying like he's amazing. I was like, I'm just trying to like stick to the stuff I know because I'm so used to the two parts and the Nas and the biggie. And like you're right, there's just so much new music going on, so much that I'm not quite sure is like as great as the past. So it's very yeah. interesting for new stuff. No, yeah. it, and you just said something <laughs> that made me think. It's also because when you, when you, you know, as you live on this earth year after year, decade after decade, mm -hmm. you've kind of already heard things that you like and appreciate. Uh, at that time, you were going through certain things mm -hmm. and to hear it on repeat from newer artists you have no connection with, it just <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't have that same effect. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I agree with you completely. That is so true. Your first film directing role, I believe, was Colors of Rage in 1999, yeah. starring Redman, who's incredible. What did you learn from directing your first film back then? And is there anything that you do completely different now while you're directing films? Oof. Well, uh, that was certainly a challenge way back in the day. I, I did it on very little money. It was blood, sweat and tears and passion. Mm. And uh, uh, I've learned, if anything, the more money the easier it is. Uh, that, that, that's, <laughs> let that be some some obvious uh, uh, intelligence for somebody to understand. Um, but it's funny. I also people don't know this, but I also had Billy Porter in his first film too in that film. Yeah, wow. Billy Porter pose. He plays a street hacker in that film. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, it was. It, it's literally the trial by fire for any filmmaker. Uh, yeah. If, if 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 you're not literally being given a check or an opportunity um, by some of the means, mm -hmm. you have to show people 
what you're capable of doing. Mm. And, and, you know, this industry is, um, is pretty heartless. They don't care how or who or why or how. If you say you're a director or writer, dancer, singer, rapper, performer, they want to see, okay, well, show me. Show me. <laughs> and that's pretty much what it is. And when I created Colors of Rage, when I wrote and directed that, um, people, there wasn't such a forum for shorts. Shorts films existed and there were some festivals, but there was no way to make money off, off short films. Wow. And um, at that point in time, I'd gone through a crazy life and I think I was maybe 32 when I had actually written and directed it. Was I 27, 20? I forget. Anyways, I was later in my years. I wasn't like I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So I needed to make a film that could make some money. So uh, some people suggested making it into a short. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I need to make something that can make some money. So I eventually <laughs> made, made, I made, the, I made it to a feature and I sold it and it did really well. So uh, there I proved I could actually write, direct, produce and sell a film. So that was, you know, that point in time. <laughs> this is incredible. And you've also worked with Eminem, Ja Rule, Mob Deep, Vanilla Ice, etc. on the top selling The Hip Hop Witch. What was it like working with so many cultural icons and like what keeps you motivated every day to keep going? So um, what keeps me every day uh, going every day and keep, keep me excited about what I do is because what I do, I feel like it's not even work. Uh, mm. Every day is an open, every day I wake up, there's is an open palette of, yeah. of just opportunity, yeah. creatively, visually, anything can inspire you. Mm -hmm. So I I definitely have a lot of um, projects that are being set up now. Uh, I've had, I've had several that have been with me for over 10 years that are now getting to just do yeah. um, one called Soul of a Sister, one called Black Biddy Brown. So all genres, all with very cool and charismatic characters mm -hmm. that will bring people in. Um, going back to your first part of your question, I mean, having worked with so many different artists, not just in that particular um, Blair Witch spoof, but mm -hmm. just across the board, um, I've learned that working with artists, actors, um, crew members, it's the same as just meeting every, anybody else on any particular kind of job that you, that you may, may have mm -hmm. had or held or are going through right now. It's, people are just people. Mm -hmm. um, some you get along with more, some you don't get along with at all. Some you just, it was like, did that really even happen? <laughs> uh, you know, and some are just so fast and furious that, you know, it was just like, you know, it was just a job. Yeah. And there was no real time for any personal exchange. Mm. Uh, unlike my time with uh, Tulissa, Dappy, and Faza, which I had three or four videos with, we get to know <laughs> each other pretty well. Um, and Jim Jones and Soldier Boy, who's like still my little brother. Um, oh. A lot of people I've maintained relationships with over the years. Some are in music still. Some have passed on to other um, opportunities. Some are um, are doing other things. But um, by and large, I like to think that just the way I represent myself, I'm set and deal with people. That people have had enjoyed the experience with me, and yeah. they always want to, you know, uh, do something else down the road. Yeah, that's really important, you know, to leave an important mark when you're working with people. And yeah, this industry is a lot about recommendation and who you know. So yeah, it's a great pit to leave with our listeners <laughs> so cracker is a super hard-hitting alternate history film about the black and white mystique of slavery and what it would be like if the roles were reversed what inspired you to create this concept and why do you think it's really important to tell the story the other way around uh so i get this i get asked this question a lot and <laughs> um most most people that know me understand most people that know me in my personal life it's, it's a no brainer. It just makes total sense that I would do something like this. People that don't know me just look at me on the face of, oh, who's this guy? And without, without doing any research, <laughs> just might say, why is this interesting to, to, to him? So uh, married to a black woman for 25 plus years, really only dated black and brown women in my life. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of my people in my sphere for the last 30, 40 years are mostly black and brown. Um, I have plenty of white friends, plenty of white coworkers, white family, all that stuff. But by and large, a lot of black and brown are in my universe. Yeah. So um, I think it was after, uh, and, and so having said that, Colors of Rage as an example, which dealt with an interracial couple with me starring in the lead and my ex, and my ex in that film um, was a singer. Um, I, I always had a tendency to um, be, have one foot more in understanding what you know, interracial mm -hmm. um, existence is. Uh, Whereas, you know, it was still kind of foreign 
to friends and family 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and now with what's going on in the world, uh, it kind of just has, has, has elevated its, its ugliness as opposed to its more beautiful side. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, due to politics um, and race relations overall, and um, I've always sort of kept an eye on it. I've always been in it. I always get it. I always know how to handle myself when things would go awry, whether it's yeah. in personal or in, in, in public spaces. Um, and in business, I always had to contend with, you know, uh, black or brown or white looking at me side eyed for whatever <laughs> reason that, that, that they have going on. They just, they, whatever, that, whatever that was, it was. But it was, wasn't until um, the incident in Charlottesville happened when you know there was a protester um that got um run down by a white supremacist uh, advocate and then there was that famous quote by trump saying there's good people on both sides and at that point in time within about a week i saw on social media um people who i'd known for years i even if even from playing hockey and soccer and baseball with these kids I may not have spoken to them for you know a couple of decades, but we still knew each other. Yeah. So when I suddenly see one or two or three of them, my um, former um, friends, post memes of um, images and visual visuals of black men getting shot by cops and laughing about it, I'm like, wow, I've never seen this before, ever coming from. I've seen it because it existed from the extremes on both sides. But to see it coming from, you know, closer circles and people mm. that you grew up with that you never knew had that sort of perspective. Yeah. And I said to myself, wow, I mean, not only do most of these people know that, you know, I'm married to a black woman or dated, you know, black women, mm -hmm. uh, but it's inherently wrong to, to do, to have that sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, belief that you can just put something like that online and just- Exactly. <laughs> So, so, um, so I said to myself, I asked myself, I said, wow, irregardless of the, me knowing these people, but everybody else that posts these, these kinds of um, memes and, and this, you know, despicable content, like what makes them think that this is okay? And, and like, wow, I, I, if they've seen Roots, they've seen 12 Years a Slave, they know inherently it must be wrong to enslave another human being. Mm -hmm. What would make them think it's okay? Like what, if, if, if they, after knowing all that stuff, if knowing slavery is just wrong and you still post things like this, what would make you think that this is not okay? Mm -hmm. And it finally occurred to me, I said, wow, okay. What if it was their mother mm -hmm. or their daughter or their brother put in that same situation that they're posting about? Mm -hmm. That was the trigger for me to develop and create cracker yeah that's really powerful and yeah i really do help hope people have sat and resonated with the message and thought to themselves actually if that was me and the shoe was on the other foot what would that mean you know it's sad that it would take something like this for them to have that type of empathy anyway because we're all humans but oh, i don't have the answers i don't have the answers myself well no and, and that's in in off that response i get asked quite a bit what makes me the person that feels like I can change people? And it's not so much like I feel like I'm responsible for changing people. I felt like it was my personal, uh, because I understand inherently, listen, there's there's white people like me and there's white people who are have no clue as to what diversity is or what inclusiveness is. And then, then there are some white people who think like, oh, I got a black friend who's this and I would never hurt them, but they still have these, this racial white privilege undertone to them. And it's, it's the majority of those people mm. that need something like this that makes them, they suddenly see a scene in Cracker, which in no way, shape or form is anywhere near as graphic and as, as, uh, as uh, uh, bloody and, and um, uh, as you've seen done to black women or black men in, in Hollywood films, mine's very, very tame. But mm -hmm. even when I see one or two clips in Cracker, they're, they're aghast, like, oh my God, how? But you see this every single time you see a film about slavery, mm -hmm. you, you're not aghast. You, you don't have that same reaction, but you, the second you see it happen to a white person, yep. you're, you're, you're in your feelings. Like, that, so that in itself is just, blows my mind that they're not even aware of that. 
Like yeah. seeing it happen to black and brown people, but having a white person, oh no, that can't happen. Like how dare he even do this? It just blows my mind that that people have that 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 thought process. I am praying for a better world because I don't know what is happening out there. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it's it's you know so so um. It, but I've also I've but going back to what you what you asked before, like you know what what's uh you know no you actually said uh um you know you're concerned about basically like what's going on in this world and and is there any any hope and um at the end of the day uh when i'm asked that question what makes me the the messenger or mm -hmm. the right person to, to to deliver this film i respond with well there's never been any politician any preacher any poet any piece of art Mm -hmm. anything in the bible nothing no one has cured it like mm. no one cured racism no one of all the amazing people that have walked this earth no one has ever solved it and my, i'm not saying i can solve it but i'm simply putting a um i'm putting to, I, I put this together using science fiction as a trojan horse for people to see racism through a new lens yeah. that's all i've done using yeah. my storytelling skills and using my my humble abilities as a director to put something together that make people say, oh, okay, this, mm. and, and the aha has actually went around the world. It's, it's, it's resulted in both amazing acclaim and a tremendous amount of hate from mm. a very small faction of, of, you know, those types of people that don't like to see things like this. Yeah. Death threats, all that kind of stuff is happening. Wow, wow. But you know, what you said is like really important. There's something like similar to what Tupac always said is like, he can't guarantee he'll change the world, but he guarantees he can spark the brain that can change the world. And I believe that we should all do our part to do our best and just be better human beings in general, you know, pass the torch along as we go. You know, it, it, and, and I, I do believe uh, even having been to a few, um, Black Lives Matter rallies, even one in um, um, this conservative area that that me and Kim live in, um, we went to uh, one, and the most that we were told by a local that they've ever seen in this particular area where they hold rallies and have um, these types of uh, events, it's been like 100 people in her 30 year lifetime of living here, a local resident said 30, 100 people has, has been the most, but on this particular day, there were like 700 people and it was for BLM, and it was mostly um, young white kids because of the area. There were some black and brown for sure, but all these kids were holding up signs saying like, you've effed with the wrong generation, which is I just like, which, so I, I really feel like no matter what happens yeah. uh, in the immediate future, in the, you know, in post of uh, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and Trayvon Martin and mm -hmm. George Floyd, uh, as, as these uh, horrible moments have, have helped, you know, um, depict the nation for what it truly is at this point, I feel as those younger generations are going to be able to weed out yeah. that ugly, hate-filled part of the country, or um, you know that that faction of 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 our humanity here in America will eventually be you know weeded out just because yeah. it's it, it, it's antiquated, it's old, it's asinine, it's ridiculous, it's stupid, yeah. it's despicable, it's ugly, it's all those yeah. things. And it has no place here. So I fully agree with you, and I fully hope that it is weeded out as we continue to evolve you know were any of the scenes in cracker super hard to film and yeah i was just thinking about more of the feeder that you got when you when you were creating this alternate history apart from the death threats and stuff that you mentioned was there any other crazy feedback that you received about it no um in fact when we when i first started showing the sizzle around town with agents managers uh wme william morris agency stepped right up uh, William Morris Endeavor stepped it up and they uh, wanted to par have me partner with people like Jordan Peele or wow. Ryan Coogler, uh, Donald Glover, and there was also Jonathan, Owen Nolan's brother, who's a big, big writer who's written Interstellar and all these big wow. writers, and Carlton Cuse, who did Lost. Uh, it was literally at that high level of, of expectations that people wanted to, um, to get involved with it. And RZA, um, prior to jumping on his... Um, who series wanted to be involved and <clears throat> so we had um certainly garnered all the right attention from all the right people and then um that was right around the time the pandemic had started mm -hmm. and it kind of just like cooled a lot of the energy and action that we had uh, i definitely shared all that information you know on social media and to let people know that something like this as uh provocative as this uh 
has a, has an audience. And so yeah. ultimately we decided to partner with Vire, um, which is a black owned streamer um, who just are, have now just been added to smart TVs, which is a big thing for um, upstart streamers to, yeah. get, to get to that level is, is uh, uh, pr pretty important. So um, Vire released it after doing um, some, some um, screenings on Sunset and whatnot. And we've got a lot of critical acclaim. It's been their top uh, short for uh, several months now. And so they, they are now in the process of raising the funds to do it as a full-fledged series, wow. um, which might not just appear on um, Vire, but it could also eventually make its way into Hulu or Netflix. So, so while, that's, while that's happening with them, we're doing a lot of other things as well with Vire. So, they stepped up, they weren't scared, and they put their money where their mouth was. They took out billboards and ads and whatnot. So now they've got it to the point where now it's being considered for uh, um, the Oscars. What? I love that. Congratulations, Dale. That's incredible news, you know. Did you learn anything while creating this project? And is there anything that you, is there any main message that you hope people take away when they watch Cracker? Well, ultimately, uh, going back to what we talked about, before, you know, racism doesn't have um, a place at least in, in my world and in, in most of uh, anyone I know's uh, world. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, although Kraka is going to affect quite a bit of people, um, whether it's empathy, whether it's sympathy, whether it's any, any number of different emotions, at the end of the day, most people will come, come away with understanding or reaffirming they're understanding that, okay, racism is wrong, mm -hmm. enslaving people are, are wrong, mm -hmm. but there, there will be though there will be those those people that just don't want to hear anything, see anything, they're raised a certain way. We will never touch those people. So let those people just go live in the woods, do what they do, however they do it, you know, let them eventually just die off, whittle away, and let the world become the place that it, it, it deserves to, to, to be, you know. I hear that message. I hear that. <laughs> Do you have any advice for any new and upcoming film directors that want to start creating their own films or where to start? Do they go to school? Funding advice? Anything? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of those filmmakers who didn't go to school. I learned everything from um, I needed to learn on set. I uh, after making Colors of Rage and a few other indies, I finally was able to get into music videos when it was still extremely hard to get into music videos. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, all you need to have is this and you can be a music video <laughs> director, right? But back when I was coming up, you needed to have a film camera, film, lights, a roll of film cost between 150 and $250. I mean, one roll of film, which got you four minutes of time or wow. 10 minutes of time. And so just to buy the film, then you needed to have a, a DP, you needed an AC, you needed lights to expose the film. It, you just couldn't just grab this and go make a, go make a video or a film. Yeah. Um, so, the, so the challenges that I had then were being able to have to overcome those types of things, mm -hmm. which really meant hard money. It wasn't, there was, there was a no, there was a no app for it. There was a no, you know, there was no easy way at that point in time. So you needed to have to, you know, make it happen. So it's the same sort of approach, I guess, with today's up and comers who feel like they can be directors or writers or producers. Um, they can use the tools that they have and really just tell a story or be visually just so different in a way that they could stand apart from their competitors or their peers. Because if I was in a room and I was going against 10 directors, now there's one director, for every one director is a thousand you know, a thousand others. Mm -hmm. And again, so in, in the in the late '80s, early '90s, when I decided to make this my my career, it was still one of those things where it wasn't quite in the in the in the norm. It was something that was still kind of out there. If you had friends and family, oh, you want to be a writer, director, an actor? Well, you know, a model. Uh, uh, it's really kind of hard nowadays. Oh, sure, yeah, just follow Jake Paul or <laughs> Ariana Grande and. Uh, Kardashian just oh yeah it's, it's pretty easy so you have a shot at making it yeah, here's your camera here's your here's your ring light give it a shot here's your brand new uh, you know BMW i8 I here you go but that by and large even when even in those situations there's a lot of people that have that sort of support from their families where mm -hmm. we didn't have that support from for the most part people like me uh male female writer directors 
black or brown didn't have that same kind of support they get from their family or friends now. Yeah. And it's just a whole different culture of filmmaker today as opposed to it was back when I was coming up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but at the end of the day, it's how bad do you want it and how much work are you willing to put into it? Yeah. I knew at the end of the day, no one was ever going to out hustle me, outwork me ever. So I, I knew I was going to have success at the end of the day because yeah. I, if it meant no sleep for nine straight years, it meant no sleep for nine straight years. Right. No vacation, <laughs> weekends off. It was just nonstop. I love that. I'm very similar with that mindset too. There was an um, interview I watched with Will Smith. I've literally like remembered it verbatim. And he was like, one thing I know is if I get on a treadmill with somebody else, either you're going to get off first or I'm going to die. He's like, but you will not outwork me. And I love that. I literally live by that mantra. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Amazing. Thank you so much for that great advice, Del. So everybody, you need to hustle and just make sure you're the last person working in the room. Are there any other new exciting music videos or films that you'll be directing soon that we should look out for? I know you mentioned a few earlier. Yeah, I mentioned a few earlier. Um, my Well, aside from turning Crack into a full-fledged series, which will be one of my um, uh, most exciting moments ever, if not the most exciting, for 10 different reasons, <laughs> my next film project is a project called Soul of a Sister, mm -hmm. which is, if you can imagine, Dream Girls meets um, Precious. Yeah, uh, and I've already got two um, pretty well-known stars who want to take the leads. I can't announce yet, but uh, soundtrack will be amazing. Acting will be amazing. The roles are just, it's its a triumphant it's kind of a film. You know, a girl from the gutter left behind, traumatizes young age, meets this, this young executive at a label who was kind of the screw-up son of two different sons from this iconic music legend. Uh, and they kind of meet each, meet each other at the same, both damaged, they both meet at the, at the same time yeah. in, a, in the subway after him hearing her, her voice singing throughout the tunnels. It's, uh, yeah, so to me, this is, it, it, as much, as excited as I am that Crockett is being considered um, for an Oscar, kind of by accident, mind you, because Crockett was also a proof of concept um, film. It was never meant to be something that I ever, exhibited it was just meant to be here's what this movie can look like or this tv series can look like what mm -hmm. do you think and mm -hmm. um but just because one thing after another and then the pandemic i said this is an amazing piece of film i need to put it out there yes. and as i was still making it i i again as i was making it it was never meant to be something i i would i set out to exhibit or show to the public mm -hmm. but I, I did enough of beginning, middle, and end of a story to tie together in just in case I needed to. Mm. And fortunately, I was able to do that. Um, so I, I'm so blessed that it's, it's, it's having its run that it's having. But with Soul of a Sister, uh, because it also is almost not a sequel to, but very much a part of what Colors of Rage was with, with my first film in yeah. terms of this, this amazing singer um, and, and her big, big, big break after going through so much um, drama is it is certainly uh, Oscar and Grammy level material. And I can't wait, because I got some of the biggest people in music um, that want to be a part of this. And I just can't wait, yeah. Wow, oh my goodness. So Dale, as an amazing prolific director of some of the most epic music videos of my time, venturing into film, you've got so many exciting projects on the horizon, but so much still ahead of you in your journey. What does it mean to you to truly give your all or nothing? Uh, that's one of my mantras. I've, I've got many mantras just like that. Uh, it, it, it's going back to what we just said. It's, it's uh, as much as I enjoy um, taking a moment off, I, I, I don't think I've actually had a full on regular vacation for over a week in 25, 30 years. I just, yeah, it's just, I, when you love what you do, it's not work. Yeah. And um, every job I take, whether it's friends or family, whether it's a major label, whether it's uh, one of my film projects. I just wrapped a feature film, a horror film, I forgot to even tell you, called Shady Grove, which has um, a lot of up and coming talents, people in TV shows that you know, people that are some pretty well influencers. Yeah. It's a very, it's a Blumhouse modeled um, horror film, which we shot over 18 days in upstate New York. So uh, that's going, that was a challenge for me in terms of t undertaking horror, which I've always loved. And I wanted to just, when I, had my opportunity to do horror film, I wanted to just nail it and, and I did. So I'm excited about that. 
Um, but yeah, when you love what you do, it's not even, it's not even work. So it's just being relentless. And one of my good friends is the front man from a hardcore band called um, Hate Breed. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were my first major label music video. And that song entitled was entitled Perseverance, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite words to ever use. And one of the best songs to a hardcore video ever done. Well, one of his, one of their other best songs and song titles are Satisfaction is the Death of Desire. Wow. Satisfaction is the Death of Desire. That's so powerful. Thank you so much for your many gems dropped today on my show. And to all our listeners, I hope you've taken away so many details and interesting lessons because I sure have. Thank you so much, Dale. I really appreciate both being a guest. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.